So my name is Heidi Swank. I'm the executive director of the Nevada Preservation Foundation. We're a rather new nonprofit um, here in Southern Nevada, and we are <laughs> focused on assisting neighborhoods, assisting neighborhoods to get historic designation uh, at the local, state, or federal level. <laughs> Um, so the panel tonight, as you well know, is entitled The Mid-Century Home and Designs for Living. And this panel is honoring mid-century architect Hugh Taylor tonight, and we're doing so for two reasons. The first is his significant contribution in design of residential buildings in our town and in Southern Nevada. Uh, not just custom homes, but also tract homes. He's designed single family dwellings, uh, multiple family dwellings but also to announce a donation of the Hugh Taylor Collection to the Nevada Preservation Foundation. We're very excited. So the Hugh Taylor Collection is Mr. Taylor's entire life's work. It is all of the drawings since 1946 when Wilbur Clark brought him from Los Angeles to Las Vegas to work here as an architect. We're honored to be made stewards of this collection and are excited to share some of the drawings from the Hugh Taylor collection with you tonight. Um, you can see up on the screen now, we're kind of cycling through about 20 different drawings that we have pulled from the, from the Hugh Taylor collection and they'll be on a loop throughout the discussion. And just to give you an idea of the scope of this collection, According to Mr. Taylor's records, there is a total of almost 1,000 buildings, renovations, and whole communities that he's designed in Southern Nevada. I want to take just a second to talk a little bit about Mr. Taylor's career. As many of you know, his major works include the Desert Inn Hotel, also Sunrise Hospital, and the Red Rock Theater. But he's designed many more homes. Um, specifically, I think the one most well-known is the Antonio Morelli house that's under the care of the Las Vegas Junior League. But he's also designed homes and additions and renovations to many others in our in our valley. So tonight you'll see uh, on this on this loop of drawings homes that were owned initially by Jake Von Tobel, Rose and Louis Molaski, uh, who is, uh, they're the parents of Erwin Molaski, and I have actually lived in that home. I'm very honored to live in that home. Uh, Merv Adelson, former Councilman Al Levy, and many others. So as stewards of this collection, the Nevada Preservation Foundation will be working in stages to get it preserved. Our long-term plans are to digitize these drawings and make them accessible to the public. But first, we'll be spending about the next four months stabilizing the collection. They need to be moved into archival cabinets, so we are purchasing cabinets, lots and lots of acid-free archival paper and many large format folders. There's some minimal cleaning that needs to be done as well as humidification. And we also will be transferring the handwritten list of drawings into a digital format. So as we move forward, the Nevada Preservation Foundation will be looking for partners to help us preserving this important piece of Southern Nevada history. So we're honored to be entrusted with such an important collection, important not just for Southern Nevada, but for our entire state. So Mr. Taylor and his wife Priscilla are here with us tonight, as well as many members of their family. I'd ask that you all join me in recognizing Mr. Taylor, his work, and his impact on our communities. And I should say that just an afternoon at the Taylor's house is a wonderful thing. Lots of great stories. So for tonight's panel, we've brought in um, four experts in architecture and mid-century modernism. Each will have a few minutes to talk, and the presentations will kind of move through, through time, starting with the 1940s and also through space, beginning in Las Vegas and expanding into more regional concerns. Our first speaker is Courtney Mooney. Uh, she'll talk about the years immediately preceding the birth of mid-century architecture and the early years of modern architecture. Then Dave Knoyer, and he'll talk about the heyday of that spectacular architecture here in Las Vegas, the 1960s, with the butterfly roof wonders of Paradise Palms. Then we'll move to Corey Buckner, who will branch outside Nevada to look more regionally at modernist tract housing, and then finally finish with Eric Strain, who will bring us into the 21st century and talk about the impact of mid-century architecture on today's homes. 
So after the presentations are, are finished, we'll launch into a discussion of mid-century home and design. And toward the end at about 6.45, staff will come around and have cards for you if you'd like to ask questions. They also have pencils so you can write down questions and, and they'll come up this way at about 6.45 I'll so just make that announcement so you know that these will be coming around. Uh, so we'll start then with um, Courtney and um, go ahead. Me? All right, great. Fighting wind and technical issues. Okay. discussion about uh, World War II housing in Las Vegas and also just a, a brief mention of Henderson um, because uh, this is kind of the precursor to what we consider mid-century modern in Las Vegas and, and, and regionally. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start off with uh, Basic Town Site, which was built in 1942. It started construction in 1942. Basic Town Site was commissioned by the government to house employees of Basic Magnesium in Henderson, Nevada. It was designed by Paul Williams in a contemporary ranch style, which is exhibited by the uh, asymmetrical facade, a horizontal uh, emphasis, and limited ornamentation. The town site included space for schools, businesses, churches, and parks, and the layout was, and this is interesting, the layout, which you can see in the upper left, was created to confuse the enemy in the event of a night raid. And if any of you have ever driven through those streets, it works. Um, so the, the FHA had a really um, significant impact on housing in Las Vegas. Most of our World War II housing was designed according to FHA standards. The, um, uh, in the 1930s, the agency set standards for construction and it also provided mortgage insurance for loans made by banks and other private lenders. The standards prescribed the lot size, the home design, the setback and placement within the subdivision, and these really became the standard for the American suburb. Uh, because in order for private developers to obtain construction loans, they had to be certain that the FHA would insure those home buyers' mortgages. So the, um, a lot of the homes, like the Huntridge, the Mayfair, the Biltmore homes that are all located within the downtown area, those are all um, FHA-designed uh, uh, homes. And one of the things that the FHA did uh, was to design a small house or a minimal house. The goal was to create a maximum amount of usable space with as much comfort, convenience, and privacy as possible obtained for a minimum amount of money. And that often resulted, unfortunately, in a boxy two-bedroom, one-bath, one-story house of 1,000 square feet or less, which was typically designed early on in that sort of modest Cape Cod style that you see in the lower left. And you can see in the lower right um, uh, an image of the, um, the Biltmore neighborhood plan, which um, follows the FHA subdivision designs with curved streets, cul-de-sacs, and minimal access points to um, intend uh, to slow traffic. And these curvilinear plans were very important. They provided greater privacy and visual interest. They could be better adapted to topography, and they reduced the cost of utilities and road construction because they had fewer intersections. And also, uh, fewer intersections also increased public uh, pedestrian safety because it separated, um, uh, I'm sorry, because there were, there were less chances for vehicles to you know, interact with pedestrians. And also separating the street from the sidewalk with a planting strip. And the subdivisions also included space for parks and schools and commercial developments, and you see that a lot with a lot of these downtown neighborhoods, such as the Hunteridge. These are some examples of Huntridge homes right now. There's, uh, there are um, a few different plans, um, a few different roof styles, and um, uh, the way that the windows and doors are arranged. And also you can see in the lower right an aerial of the historic Huntridge neighborhood. And it shows, um, with Circle Park there in the center, and it shows um, that there was space provided for the parks, and there was um, uh, minimal curvilinear streets in the Huntridge. So Huntridge, Biltmore, and Mayfair were all built in the early 1940s. Um, 
<clears throat> in the minimal, most of the kind of in the minimal, minimal traditional style, what we know is minimal traditional, um, which means it's kind of the precursor to what we think of as the traditional ranch. There's a low or intermediate hipped or gabled roof. There's little or no eave overhang, uh, double hung wood frame windows, and minimal amounts of added architectural detail. And often they were wood frame construction that were finished in stucco. This is an example of the Mayfair home um, and the school. You can see with the subdivision design that it followed those FHA standards. There are some curved streets, there's minimal access points, and also the detached sidewalk so that you could have a planting strip with trees. The Billmore homes, um, which are Las Vegas Boulevard and um, uh, uh, Bonanza, Right, thank you. Um, <laughs> those are slightly, uh, a little more perhaps um, cottagey looking than the Huntridge neighborhood. Um, they are, uh, you can see also that they, they, um, um, they have masonry construction, slightly more symmetrical facades with that accentuated entrance and steel frame windows. So a little bit more cottagey. Which brings me to the, the Berkeley Square neighborhood, which is located at F and Owens. This was also designed by Paul Williams in the mid 1940s, but not built until 1954. And it was designed shortly after the basic townsite homes. It's very uh, similar to those townsite homes, except of course with the gabled roof. And so the similarities are pretty obvious. They're very modern. They have a horizontal emphasis, wide eaves and casement windows. And the subdivision also followed the FHA standards, but it's interesting to note that these were designed in the mid-40s, and they look absolutely nothing like the FHA homes that were being built at the time with the Huntridge and Mayfair and Biltmore, which I think speaks to Paul R. Williams' um, uh, architectural uh, credit. The Wesley neighborhood was built at the same time, and again, we're looking at a, a little bit slightly more traditional uh, ranch style. It's very different than Berkeley Square. The, um, you, but you're starting to see some modern elements in the horizontal casement windows, and they had some venting technology under the windows, which is also um, an element of mid-century modern. So you're starting to see kind of these new technologies. There was a slight variation in the setback and the placement on the lots. And then in the mid-1950s, we're, we're now moving towards the Beverly Green and Southridge neighborhood, which is um, a more contemporary ranch and has some elements of what we would consider mid-century modern. There are some sick and sharp homes in this neighborhood, which is south of Rancho, I mean, uh, Oki, south of St. Louis. Thank you. I do know where I am. Um, and uh, we're looking at asymmetrical facades, asymmetrical roof lines. We have clear story windows, decorative wall cutouts, and wide eaves with varying facade materials. And so this is kind of our move into more of this mid-century modern that we'll be, um, that Dave will be discussing in depth in the rest of our panel as well. So I hope you can see some of those architectural influences to the mid-century modern and some of those earlier World War II homes. the presentation load up. Good evening, I'm Dave Kenoyer. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. It's a beautiful night, a little windy up here, so hopefully we'll... There we go, all right. So um, as Courtney mentioned, I'm gonna talk to you a little about the uh, 1960s architecture and, and uh, what was happening in Las Vegas and more specifically in Paradise Palms. Um, so the 1960s led to a new era of planned community and homestyle here in Las Vegas. Um, Irwin Malaski, Merv Adelson, and other notable investors bought a 600-acre chunk of raw desert land uh, straddling both sides of Desert Road between Maryland Parkway and Eastern Avenue in what was the then rural Paradise Valley section of Las Vegas. And initially, the cutting-edge architecture firm uh, Palmer Chrysler was hired to build desert contemporary-styled homes. And in fact, according to a 1960 RJ article, uh, they described each home as being a contemporary desert design uh, design for modern desert living. And color was actually supposed to be a keynote to this community with exceptional care taken on each home by a uh, professional color stylist. 
So carving out of Grand Boulevard designed to enter into the community, four model homes with identical floor plans were constructed on Cayuga Parkway in, uh, in the 19, early 1960s. And each home featured varied elevations and was rotated 90 degrees from one another uh, to give distinction and character from each other. And so these original uh, contemporary desert modern track homes were first in modern design for Las Vegas. The initial 77 home sites sold up very quickly, uh, paving the way for the next phase in the development, which came in November of 1961 when the, when the uh, Planoramic Model Home Center on Desmond Road over at Seneca Drive opened up. And uh, there were 22 Palmer Chrysler designed desert modern homes to choose from, all with cutting edge futuristic styling. Uh, each elevation made use of new materials at the time. Uh, shadow block, decorative concrete screen block, native stone, lava rocks, all could be found on each home. And Palmer and Chrysler even developed Polynesian themed homes, as you can see in the uh, right hand side of the screen, to cash in on the Pacific Island tiki culture, uh, which swept the nation surrounding Hawaii's induction as a 50th state in 1959. And there was really something for everybody. Home prices back then ranged between twenty thousand and thirty-three thousand. In today's dollars, that's about one hundred sixty-three thousand to two hundred sixty-five thousand uh, dollars. Buyers could choose from varied roof lines, including the A-line, butterfly, folded plate, and flat. And typically, each floor plan offered three or four elevations in which to choose from. And as a matter of fact, the home in the upper left-hand corner and the home in the lower right-hand corner are actually the same floor plan, just one's rotated 90 degrees from the other with a different elevation, too. Um, so matching these futuristic Jetsons-esque homes was also a futuristic lifestyle. So not only were all the homes all electric with all the latest features, but the lifestyle that was being promoted by Paradise Homes at the time was just as futuristic. Uh, Paradise Palms offered the first real country club lifestyle in town for families. They had the championship stardust golf course, which offered uh, special deals for homeowners. The clubhouse had all the latest and greatest amenities. Uh, they had a full-time golf pro, locker rooms, and of course the requisite 19th hole that every country club needs. So, uh, also in a first, the community featured a private park off of Spencer Street, and it had a baseball diamond, it had shuffleboard, it had tennis courts. And so included in this country club lifestyle was actually a full-time athletic director. So even the leisure activities of the day were now planned for future living. Uh, convenient shopping was also right around the corner as uh, what was temporarily dubbed the Parkway Mall, now the Boulevard, was planned at the western edge of the community. So as the 60s marched forward, Paradise Homes sold chunks of Paradise Palms to different home builders who brought in a myriad of housing styles. Uh, they epitomized the attainable luxury lifestyle in Las Vegas back then, and, and uh, California-based Americana homes uh, built very large traditional ranch homes. You can see their original model, which uh, the lower right-hand corner, that's on the corner of Twain and Spencer today. Um, and they built very large traditional ranch homes, both on the golf course and then near the Planet Mall site. And these were marketed towards traditional home buyers, many of whom had just moved to Las Vegas from out of state. Uh, they might not be ready for kind of the wild Palmer Chrysler designs that we see in other parts of the community. But these homes were, at the time that they were built, were so popular that many were actually sold fully furnished. And oftentimes, as soon as the models were constructed, they'd be sold. Uh, following Americana were Val and Lee Valentine, seen in the upper left-hand corner there. They built tropical estates in the western portion of Paradise Palms, and they brought their own take on desert dwelling with them from Bakersfield, California. Uh, they built something of a hybrid of a desert modern and traditional ranch home uh, with low slung homes uh, featuring lace and decorative concrete block, uh, white tropic cool roofs, and opulent bathrooms. And their greatest legacy, really, of the Valentines left Las Vegas, of course, is the iconic uh, custom built home on Cochise Lane, which was made famous in 1994's film Casino. So, and actually, the casino house there in the lower left hand corner is based off of one of their existing floor plans, which is the home on the right. So, other styles that uh, characterized the mid-60s here in Paradise Palms were the modern and desert, were the desert modern and contemporary ranch hybrids that were found in Fountain Blue Estates built by Eastern Enterprises, and then the semi-custom homes, the Stellar Greens, built by Dale Bradley. And both of these builders offered their own take on uh, luxury desert contemporary architecture with grand entryways, large windows, walls of sliding glass, and then varied roof lines as well. 
And then as the last builders are finishing up in Paradise Palms, Paradise Palms begun their next two golf course country club communities. Uh, the first one being Black Mountain Estates uh, in Henderson, and then the Winterwood Country Club over in East Las Vegas. But uh, Black Mountain Estates actually featured about three dozen 1964 Palmer Crescent Design homes. Uh, however, the Las Vegas market suffered a recession shortly thereafter, and only a few uh, homes were built around the valley, actually, until the later 1960s. So had the social recession ever occurred, Henderson would have had their own community really to rival Paradise Palms. Yet, recession did happen, and it effectively ended the modernist tract home movement here in town. So with that, thank you, everyone, and I'll turn it over. I'm a practicing architect and a writer, and I thought I'd take you a little bit west and a little bit south to Los Angeles. I want to speak about a couple of the housing developments there and a few words about the preservation uh, efforts that have been made. This is uh, a, an area called uh, Crestwood Hills now. It was originally called Mutual Housing Association. It was designed by A. Quincy Jones, Whitney Smith, and Edgardo Contini. And it's, it's a very interesting example because this is actually built as a cooperative. So the owners, originally 500 members, purchased 800 acres, hired the architects, and hired the contractors to build these homes. They, uh, A. Quincy Jones and um, uh, Whitney Smith and uh, Garrett Echo, the landscape architect, did a lot of the site design. And what's unusual about this is the houses are fairly small, the 1,000 square feet to 1,500 square feet. And they were on small lots, so there are 350 residential lots. The rest of the area was to be a communal area for a clubhouse, a preschool, a little market, a drugstore, uh, not, not drugstore, a gas station, and a plant nursery. Um, so there was to be a larger communal area in the middle. So because the houses were so small and so close together, the architects designed them to be at different angles to each other and to the street, which created a greater distance between each house and created a, a real variety. Today, you hardly see the houses from one another. Um, one of the designing or interesting features about it is the dramatic architecture, these great sweeping roofs on, on several of the designs. A. Quincy Jones felt strongly that dramatic architecture shouldn't be just for the wealthy. It should across all economic uh, uh, elements. And he, uh, he uh, was very uh, instrumental in creating these great floating roofs. The, the founding members were also set on having modern architecture because they felt it um, emphasized their progressive views, uh, their political progressive views. They're all very left-wing. This was right in the middle of a very right-wing community, so they were frowned upon for the most part, but uh, when my husband and I first moved in in 1995, there was very little in place to save these houses. There were originally 75 of the original designs built on these 350 lots. What happened was that two of the contractors went bankrupt building these houses, which were supposed to be very simple to build, but turned out to be much more complicated. So at that point, the owners were left on their own to either hire their architects or hire the contractors to build. And, and what remains of the remaining lots are called infill houses. We do have an architecture committee, but that architecture committee has been a little lax over the years, so there's a lot of really sad additions to these houses. So when we first uh, joined the community, we tried to get everybody interested in an HPOZ, which would be a preservation overlay zone over the entire community, but we couldn't get enough people interested. So I decided to go in with a handful of houses, about four houses uh, every two years, uh, to get them declared historic monument. And so far, I was able to get 15, but now we have 18 declared of what I consider 31 remaining pretty good examples of these houses. This is one that uh, I was a consultant on, and the, uh, the owner, this is one of the new owners that has joined the community, and fortunately the new people really get it. They really want to preserve these houses. They realize that the value is in the historical context of the house. So he went to great efforts to match all the plywood and the made refrigerator. Um, after I moved into this community, I met Elaine Jones and saw the incredible archive she had for Jones' work. So I um, 
published, I find the press published this book on A. Quincy Jones. Now, A. Quincy Jones partnered with Paul Williams on uh, several projects in Palm Springs very early on. What interests me a lot about Jones' work is that his interest in site planning, and he he took this example in San Diego. A lot of the houses were built. This is for the Del Webb developer. But what houses he could control, he, he changed the different angles to the street, and then he did a very unusual thing, and he took the landscaping and he crossed property lines so that he creates, creates this really interesting landscape, of arch I mean, landscape in between the houses. This is another uh, project that was designed in 1948, about the same time as Crestwood Hills was being built. And it was a house for a, a San Diego developer, and it was designed to be purchased and built on any flat lot. So there are houses in San Diego, but there's also a couple up in the Los Angeles area. What this house did, though, was it, uh, it was published in Architectural Forum, as was a Joseph Eichler. He was published as a builder of the, uh, yeah, builder of the year and A. Quincy Jones as architect of the year. So Eichler called Jones. They created a friendship and a working uh, relationship that lasted until Eichler's death in 1974. So Jones and his then partner, Frederick Emmons, designed, uh, they were the one of three architect teams that designed uh, over 10,000 homes for Joseph Eichler throughout California. And this is Green Meadow, which Jones is, and Emmons are responsible for. And this shows a real interest in creating not only just housing, but a, a way of life, a way of living. So he would he would design community centers, swimming pools, parks. He, he wanted to create an area where people would come together and not be isolated within their houses. This is a, a development in, there are three developments in Southern California. This is one that's in um, Caneo Valley, Thousand Oaks. It's a very simple gable model. This is the more complicated, the atrium model that he developed for Eichler and became hugely popular. And uh, Jones and Evans and John Chapman, who worked in his office, created this uh, to-do book for developers. It's very simple, a lot of pictures of his own developments, a lot of do this, don't do that, trying to explain to uh, builders how they could actually build a better home for, for their clients and, and to create, a, as I say, a way of living, a community out of this instead of just uh, strict, dull housing. On the preservation uh, theme, I wanted to mention this last project, Mar Vista Housing uh, by Gregory Ain in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I, I find this a really interesting community. There were originally 150 houses planned, but only 50 built. And they were built, uh, I believe, uh, 48, 49, 50. Um, the amazing thing about this is that community had no protections on it whatsoever, and almost all of them are, are intact. And a historical uh, preservation overlay zone was added, I think, around 10 years ago now. But um, it's a joy to to, uh, to drive down these. I think there's three or four streets that are they're all intact. All the landscaping's all by Garrett Ekbo. Very interesting community. Thank you. My name is Eric Strain. I'm an architect here in Las Vegas, and I guess I'm going to take you to kind of where Midmodern has influenced us. So, I grew up in Las Vegas, and when I was around these homes, I was, I'd never lived in the Paradise Palms, but I kind of worked in that area, and so I was very familiar with these homes. And they still have that uh, influence on the work that we're doing now. And that way. So we still constantly look back to what made these homes unique the modern design of them, the use of modern materials, the glass that allows you to live inside and outside, um, and the use of color. What annoys us is we don't see that in current day work. We kind of went through this period and then you start looking at today's work and it's all Tuscan and another version of Tuscan and then a little bit different version of Tuscan. So, we really looked at this work and, and how it kind of defined Las Vegas and then started looking to Palm Springs to see what they did in Palm Springs. It's very similar kind of climate. How did they start to work? 
looking at the work of um, Albert Frey, Don Wexler, and even Kauf the Kaufman House. So how can we take those ideas that were so influential at the time and start to bring them back into the housing of today? So we've been fortunate in the last few years to do several homes up in um, Summerlin, or larger custom homes, but it's those same principles that establish that mid-modern. How do we live outside when it's 110 degrees? So we've convinced people that you don't have to be outside under air conditioning, but when it's done right and you apply these principles of movement and shadow and shade and air circulation, you can basically create an outdoor living room very similar to what they created in the 50s with the new modern. The use of the courtyards where we can open up major expanses of the home to out into those outdoor spaces. The, the arrangement of the volumes to, to protect the courtyard so that you can open up even when it's windy like today. We can still shelter that wind and allow you to move in and out. The use of glass to, to really break that barrier from the inside to the outside. So over the last six or seven years, we've been doing this kind of work. Um, all, ma all major projects for us, but all very, um, very large budgets that really haven't gave, given us the opportunity to create homes for mainstream buyers or the kind of communities that, we, that they talked about earlier today that we established 40 homes. Just recently, after these last few homes, we've had a developer come to us that has been through these homes and, is, and on his own has sensed that kind of connection to the mid-modern style and now has asked us to start our very first um, modern development here in Las Vegas. This project will be announced here in the next few months. It's going to be 40 units, um, three different plans within the about 1,500 square feet, so they become, they're in that model that we can afford, not just the custom home market. So he sensed within the work that he saw in Summerlin, our affinity to that modern design, and now has asked us to really come back and start these new projects. So it's the influence of what early Las Vegas was, combined with that Palm Springs influence that we've looked at, that we really think um, what mid-modern was about was establishing a sense of place, a sense of permanence, looking at the materials of the time. So these projects take that mid-modern look, but they start applying new materials to them, materials of today, in the same manner that they did in the, in the mid-modern. Well, thank you so much to all the panelists for really great presentations and lots of uh, food for thought. So I was trying to figure out how best to get started with the, the conversation. And one of the, the questions that, that always intrigues me is how do we end up naming something? How do we, how do we end up, how do we know that we have this category of things called the mid-century home? How can we have a panel and say, we're gonna talk about the mid-century home and have everybody say, oh, I know, I have an idea of what that's going to be. So I wanna kind of throw that out to the panelists to talk about what are some of the technological innovations of that time? What is it that makes the mid-century home a category? That makes, is that, I'm just gonna throw it out there, just feel free to jump on in. Does that work? Yeah. The war effort really uh, improved a lot of the materials like plywood, and plate glass. Uh, a lot of these materials could span a greater span. And, and uh, also the, the idea that you could have exposed boom, um, post and beam ceiling, which opened up the space, created this indoor-outdoor door area. Um, I think just improvement with materials and all of the architects coming into Los Angeles and I guess Las Vegas as well were really eager to use these materials for the first time. 
and, and that's a really valid point. The use of new materials was uh, was something that really defines what is mid-century modern home. And it's it's that decorative concrete block. It's the screen block. It's the shadow block. It's it's the uh, the use of the nat native stone, the natural stone. And and if you think about architecture today, how often do we see these new materials coming up in design? We don't because there's just no real innovation. It's Tuscan and different variations on Tuscan nowadays. I think what we, we had an opportunity to sit with Don Wexler and, and talk about his work in Palm Springs and and the mid-modern influence. And every time we used the word mid-modern to Don, he came back and said, there's no such thing. We were not trying to establish a style back then. What was important to us was creating space of that particular time, of that particular moment, of the, of the materials that were new and coming online. It wasn't about trying to establish a continuation of tradition, and they weren't trying to establish some new style. They were just trying to respond to the environment of Palm Springs and of the materials they had at hand that they could use. Um, so it's interesting to see um, you know, when you go back to Palm Springs for Modernism Week and you and they all celebrate Mr. Wexter and they throw parties for him, he gets very uncomfortable when he gets and his work is celebrated in that manner because to him it was just the appropriate thing to do. It wasn't trying to make some new style. That just is it. Two weeks ago, uh, Ken McCown of the um, UNLV Downtown Design Center gave a talk for us on uh, on Richard Neutra's work, and he also talked about how um, this isn't a style; it was um, it was a concern with how people live, and that there was this idea about um, the ways in which people inhabited space and how to make spaces healthier and life healthier, and that was a lot of what was happening in this in the Modernist project. And so in some ways it's not even, it's not so much about the houses, it's how they, how they were used and how they, they brought about a, a healthier lifestyle for people. After the war there was also greater interest in leisure time, or leisure time became available. So this whole idea of a house being indoor and outdoor, um, pleasant areas to, to congregate, I think became, became essential at that point. I think so. I think there's such an um, optimism in that era. I mean, I would just add that, you know, with air conditioning, uh, the advent of air conditioning, that the windows became larger and there was little care about, you know, working the building with the environment. So you you uh, you could just it was sort of devil may care with the design. <laughs> so one. So at this point, I think it would probably be um, good for the staff to bring around the question cards. I think that people have, I think that people have some questions, right? So um, there'll be staff circulating if you'd like to ask a question to write it down and then they'll bring them up and just hold up your card when you have it and then they can come and pick it up from you. But that's, yeah, I think that these are these are concerns and it's kind of like we're coming full circle with some of the things that, that Courtney talked about too, but you know, I think a, a lot of theme that, was, theme that was coming through in your talk was this 
um, reductions in costs, not just for the home, but also for the entire community, to have fewer intersections, to have minimal decorations on homes, to make things more accessible to, to regular people. So another thing when we're thinking about the mid-century home, we think about this category or whatever this style or whatever we want to, however we want to talk about it, that there's a, a big, as you can watch um, these homes go past that Mr. Taylor design, there's a wide array of homes. Um, many different, um, different, different looks for all of these different homes. So I'm wondering if we could just talk a little bit about the characteristics of these styles and kind of broadly across the United States that was happening at that time. Case study, John Intensa's case study program had a lot to do with influencing um, the public in Los Angeles. And he introduced modern architecture to the general public, a lot of the new appliances, electric appliances, every, everything that was sort of cutting edge of, of in our, in architecture at that time. He, uh, he started a case study program. There were, I think, originally eight houses that he, he financed. Um, the architects built, they were open to the public, and thousands of people went through these houses. So it's uh, almost an immediate interest in the, in the modern technology of at that time. And I think that that spread across the United States pretty quickly. And, I mean, obviously, the post and beam and sort of open uh, environment doesn't work in the very cold areas of uh, back in the Northeast. But uh, I, I think it was a, a lot of it was uh, what grasped with great enthusiasm. And you have to also look at uh, the popularization of the American West at the time, too, and that greatly influ influenced houses in the ranch style. And we have a lot of ranch style homes, and oftentimes they aren't celebrated because they are also kind of in the minimalist. They contain minimal ornamentation. They don't exactly have the kind of wow, jet set contemporary architecture that we all are kind of salivating at and calling it century modern now. But uh, uh, that was definitely a huge influence in design. Um, as far as what was happening culturally across the country. So in, in Las Vegas, we definitely have kind of a cross-section of the types of mid-century houses that we see across the country. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about why you think some of these houses became more popular. I know that um, uh, Corey was talking about post and beam and wide open spaces, maybe not so good in Minneapolis when, you're, when you have you know, sub-zero temperatures. But are there are other, other ones that are best adapted to um, our Las Vegas climate? Our experience. Um, several of the homes that, that we're working on, we, we literally are able to um, cool without an air conditioner. So that when you apply these same principles, with these vast openings that allow you to, to circulate natural air through them, you can literally turn the air on. So it, it's going back why the mid-modern um, style encouraged this and it looked at new technologies, we still kind of look back on what makes desert living work. And, and it's those traditional values of just basic desert design applied to a mid-modern sense that we can create a 1,500 square foot house and hopefully have uh, a, a very small air conditioning bill so that that we can afford to live in those. Um, the vast amount of daylight that we're able to bring in there, new technology that allows us to do skylights and solar tubes that we can basically light a house now um, adds to that. And I think all of that comes from that mid-modern sense. That decorative block, that shadow block, there's now technology out there where, in the past, well after the 50s and then modern, when, we, when you would do a block home, the local building codes would require us to insulate the inside of the wall so you couldn't expose that block inside and out. So today there's a new technology that's been developed that instead of filling the, the CMU full of concrete, they actually fill it full of insulation, which allows us then to create a much better wall but also then allow the material to read inside and out. So again, we're just going back to those those basic principles um, and, and applying them to, to our specific environment. 
environment. So one of the themes that um, I kind of picked out across several of the um, presentations was the ways in which these these weren't just designing houses, they were designing communities. And they were, um, not only were they trying to confuse the enemy, but they were also um, you know, bringing in parks and you were building, and, and this whole idea that Dave talked about, uh, about the lifestyle, that they sold this is really as a lifestyle. So in, we really saw in the 20th century a lot of the birth of these kinds of communities, of, of building communities, but we also saw you know, suburbs, subdivisions. So I'm wondering if, if you guys can kind of talk about how do we differentiate between, we talk about suburbs, subdivisions, planned communities, how do we, how do we divide how do we divide them? I, how do we define each of these categories, or and where do they blur? Um, the, with the Huntridge neighborhood, <clears throat> the plan was to to conserve on resources, and so they wanted shopping and they wanted schools and those types of things within walking distance. Because I think in one of the ads, it, it actually said we want to conserve the rubber of your tires of your vehicles for the war effort and those types of things. So they wanted you to walk and, and rather than drive, and I think that was important during the war. Um, but it wasn't necessarily. I, it, it was. It was. Basic town site was definitely more of a planned community, similar to what we see today, like Summerlin, because they planned out everything. They planned out the churches and the businesses and and the schools and you know um, uh, all of the things that you would need. It was very self-contained, whereas um, with with regular subdivisions or subdivisions, even in, 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 in uh, the Huntridge and Mayfair, they left space for that type of thing, but it wasn't necessarily part of the development all built at once. And, and something like Summerlin, where you have everything is very planned out, you know, right at the start, it's all kind of laid out for you. So I would say that that's sort of the difference. Done that way today? I mean, yeah, they do because they did fill in that way. Um, the the um, of course some of the neighborhoods, you know, with with the recession, um, lost some of those services that were kind of essential to those neighborhoods that were within walking distance. But I think now it's it's starting to make a comeback. And you know, with the redevelopment of downtown, and there's everything. If you live within a, a mile radius, there's everything now within walking distance. One thing that really strikes me when I drive through uh, town and I. So I sort of went from one mid-century development to the other, are the extraordinary churches, which are, I mean, those in themselves are architectural monuments, and you usually see them very close to the developments, planned that way. Is there anything being done to preserve these, or they, there's no threat to them, I suppose? They're definitely on my radar, okay. along with um, several of the amazing mid-century banks that we have in town that are definitely um, on, on the radar. Well, in Los Angeles, uh, unfortunately, the, the library, whoever controls the library department or whatever it is, they should be strung and quartered because they've destroyed the most incredible mid-century libraries, just right and left. Does, does that happen here? The legislative building in Carson City. Uh. Yes, it's a beautiful, if you've seen pictures, it's a, it was a beautiful 1960s building that's covered with um, stucco and faux pillars. Um, so lots of good work gets done there, but it's not a beautiful building. So yeah, that, that definitely does happen here probably a lot more often than we maybe want to admit. Probably to a lesser extent to some of the public schools that we have, uh, after a certain point in time, they tend to age out and the school district finds it easier to tear them down and start all over as opposed to uh, restoring them. And we do have some beautiful uh, mid-century schools here in town with wonderful folded plate roofs uh, and uh, and just spectacular design that just isn't really cherished like it should be. And there's also the amazing the amazing Clark County School District building on Flamingo, right? That, that I think we all know is in shed. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Do we have any any questions? From, if you have questions, hold up your hold up your cards. The staff can come around and grab them. For you. 
Um, so I wanted to ask just a question about how mid-century design, I see that um, Eric had to run out for just a moment, but we'll see if we can start with him on this. To talk more about how mid-century design has influenced city planning today, I think Eric has uh, talked a bit about the influences on the buildings themselves, but um, how has, what has been that impact on how we plan or don't plan our, our, our cities today? Um, I'll start and then I'll hand it to Dave. Um, I think we, we are now, this, the, I can speak for the city of Las Vegas, we are really looking at the issues of walkability and uh, sustainability and we're kind of realizing that um, some of those elements that make a neighborhood walkable or sustainable are, are very traditional elements like what we were seeing in um, uh, the, the Mayfair and the Biltmore and neighborhoods where you have um, just something as simple as the sidewalk that's separated from the street with a planting strip that, that, that provides a comfortable walking experience, um, smaller block sizes, um, a lot of you know different entrances, like a grid kind of pattern, so that you can get out of your neighborhood quickly and access some of these um, services or retail or whatever it is you want to see. And these are all very traditional things, and we're kind of looking back at these older neighborhoods to see how that functioned, how they worked, and how those designs were created, and bringing those back into um, into what we're doing today. We we have adopted a complete streets uh, design. Um, uh, standards which asks for that detached sidewalk or slightly narrower streets, maybe narrower lots, um, street trees, those types of things that just encourage walking in the desert. A lot of that has to do with, again, um, the recession where we found that some of the demographics are changing, some of the economics are changing, people aren't driving as much, it's too expensive to drive, gas is too expensive, and we're you know, having more seniors that are moving into these um, compact urban areas. And so we're looking at ways that we can accommodate that um, through, through um, forward thinking planning, which is really backwards thinking because it's going back to uh, some of the FHA principles, interestingly enough. But um, I, I can see Dave is itching to jump in, so. But you also have to look at too, as we moved on a little bit further in uh, in the mid-century area, that uh, a lot of the subdivisions became larger and grander scaled and oriented towards the car culture. Because you have to remember, of course, the car culture was huge and everyone had a car and it was gas was cheap and we could build further and further out and contribute to the sprawl issue and a lot of these communities and, and mine is one of them where we have all the curvilinear streets and and we do have all the convenient shopping but it's a lot of it's more convenient for those of us who own an automobile but for the you know for the 30 33 34 percent of the population who doesn't drive it does it can create an issue especially when you get into some of the larger uh, scale communities that happened a bit after the mid-century movement where it becomes a little bit more challenging for homeowners and residents to kind of age out of their properties because a lot of times they do have to retire into something that's a bit more convenient because they can no longer access the, uh, the things like grocery stores and shopping and, and as Courtney mentioned though we are looking at the city is looking at adopting these plans which help to correct to some of these issues where walkability isn't um, it isn't really present for some of these neighborhoods so we're looking at correcting that and, and just enhancing these communities so they can turn into places where the residents can age in place. One other, one other question I wanted to bring up is that I've, I've noticed and maybe um, some other people have noticed this too that recently you can uh, buy plans to build an Eichler so you can build a new old Eichler and I'm wondering what the panel kind of thinks about this trend and um, as far as um, mid-century buildings and preservation and what that I mean I'll just, I'll just throw that out there to see what people think about that idea of building new old buildings I would say rather than buy an Eichler plan and build a new Eichler I would put your money in restoring uh, these houses I was looking at today I, our neighborhood actually had a lot of derelict houses, very rundown houses when we moved in. And it took a lot of publicity, writing articles, getting getting magazines uh, interested, you know, dwell, uh, all just a media blitz to get the public interested in these houses that there's value. 
and now they sell for a great deal of money and they, they're on the market for maybe two days and they're purchased. That needs to happen here. I, and I can't think of the name of the neighborhood, but um, the Chrysler one, so. Yeah, but, but there's so many houses there that really need help. So forget about buying a new Eichler. Just put your money there and you're gonna see it. it and truly, it happens. On to some, um, there's some great questions that came in from the audience. Um, one was, can you speak a bit about how, how mid-century modern architecture has roots in the evolution of prefabricated or modular construction and design and how it applies to design today? The NHA houses are actually technically designed to be almost prefab. They were designed so that they could use a, a four by eight piece of plywood very economically. Um, they got a little distracted in their detailing. I think the architects got distracted and it was a little bit more complicated than they thought. Their idea was to make something standard so that it could be built over and over again. They learned their lesson and I think when they designed, both when A. Quincy Jones and Frederick Gemmis designed for Eichler, that became much more, I wouldn't say it was a prefab, but standardized uh, members that they could put together and it became very economical and very fast to build those and, and it was fast and quick to build those houses. Uh, the, the Lustron, uh, the experiments in the early kind of kit homes, like the Lustron homes, which were these metal homes, I, I'm not an expert on them, but they, they, they were airlifted in, right, with a helicopter or something, and you would get this kit, and then you could just, they just built them one after another. Right, prefab's not a new thing, right. it's been around a long time. One of the great things about the Lustrin homes is that you could put your all of your pictures and wall hangings up with magnets, because your walls were metal. <laughs> it was metal. It was wonderful. Um, so why and when and why did home design change from, from the aesthetic to the bland developer design so common in North America? And how can we bring back thoughtful design for all versus mass production? I think that was the key. Uh, sorry, I just step out. I apologize. Um, I, think, I think what happened was mid-modern, that, that era, they really were trying to establish a lifestyle. In the 70s, that lifestyle was how much money can I put in a developer's pocket? So the mid-modern required, like Corey talked, it's tough, it's tougher to build those homes. There's a there's a sense of quality that has to go into those and a richness that goes into those. And details become important. There's no such thing as an important detail in a Tuscan home. You cover it with trim, and it's very easy to kind of hide that kind of work. So it's a mass production. It's let's generate these homes as fast as we can. We have a population that's moving into the West at, at a rate that we've never seen before, and we need homes faster than we need lifestyle. So that's really where where I think that where the change started happening in Las Vegas. Because I know in, in Las Vegas we had such explosive growth. Is this something that we see in in other cities across the country too? We took a tour. We took a group of architects from Las Vegas to Phoenix about ten years ago, um, riding around looking at different work in Phoenix. And one of the guys in the back of the bus started screaming to the point that we thought there was an emergency going on. Bus driver slammed on his brakes. And what it was, was we just passed a street, the same name street that he lives on in Las Vegas, and the exact same home that he lives in Las Vegas was in Phoenix. So I, I don't think it was a, a Las Vegas, it was, it really cut across the board from Southern California to Las Vegas to Phoenix, Tucson, up into New Mexico and Texas. It really was a Southwest kind of. All right, so one more question. Um, is the use of mixed or 
or dual system evaporative cooling and AC, something you would incorporate in a home in Las Vegas? More technical question. Yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what is the benefit to evaporative cooling? I mean, maybe, maybe that's maybe more of the question I think that they might want the benefit of there. Evaporate cooler and helps bring the humidity level up. It, um, if, if you look at the work that we try to do when we try to create an outdoor environment, there's always some type of water feature, some kind of movement. So you take those principles and evaporate cooler and start to apply them to courtyard spaces. It's the same thing they did thousands of years ago in the in the deserts. So it, it's, a, it's it's an evolution of trying to bring humidity. And a change in the viewpoint of the I know at the, um, the Red Fort in New Delhi, they have a system of streams that used to run throughout the entire complex, and it did just that. It was for cooling. But it, we're talking a very large complex of buildings with this, um, all of these pools and streams running, and they actually had young, young boys who would carry the water from the river to keep the system running because it didn't keep going on its own, but it did keep the place cool. Um, so one one last question. Are there any, any other questions that want to come in from the audience? Anything over here? I guess this is out there. If you could uh, give it to the, just because I think it's easier for people to hear if we, um, Oh, we're just, it makes it easier if we can hear from you. Okay. I mean, I'm sure you can speak with Eric afterwards, too. Um, his, uh, one last question is, when will Clark County have a preservation ordinance, and how can we protect buildings outside the city limits? I thought maybe uh, Dave could talk about this a little bit. Sure. Uh, so, so, one of the great things is Clark County has taken baby steps and it's taken its first initial step by adopting the historic neighborhood overlay, which um, which I think was adopted in 2011, uh, and it's designed for residential neighborhoods only uh, to, I guess basically it, it allows for more design review, allows for more neighborhood notification, and uh, uh, and then uh, more design review on any new construction, uh, major modifications to homes, things like that. Uh, the historic neighborhood overlay hasn't been tested out yet, but uh, uh, the community of Paradise Palms is taking its first step towards, uh, towards historic preservation and is working uh, with Heidi's Foundation here to, uh, to become the first neighborhood in Clark County that is uh, considered historic. It's it's the first step though. It's really a very light ordinance, but uh, uh, it should it should help for preservation efforts within the county. The um, the Nevada Preservation Foundation is also working with a couple of the Clark County commissioners to um, um, expand that ordinance to beyond just neighborhoods, so it can apply to individual homes and structures, um, so that we can maybe get some protections locally for the Betty Willis sign uh, and you know, uh, these very historic structures that aren't necessarily neighborhoods. It's something we're definitely working on. So as a closing question, um, I, the, the National Trust is advocating for the preservation of what they call the recent past. That's resources that are uh, were built within the last 50 years. And I'm wondering um, what kinds of challenges the panel sees of, you know, for this endeavor across the United States as, as well as across Southern Nevada. And you know, what are some of the challenges and what are the, some of the things that are actually going to be easy for us in um, preserving the recent past? It's documenting everything as fast as you can and to get a public interest aware of, of the buildings. Because when, once the awareness is focused on it, it's less likely for anybody to tear them down and they'll be discouraged by that. Um, and that's crucial. I mean, the faster we can do that, the better. I, I think it's hard. Just what I've run into in my job is that it's difficult for people to accept that the house that they built is historic. Um, 
and so <clears throat> I, we, we just run into that a lot with people who say, this can't be historic because I raised my family here and that means I'm historic. And <laughs> so <clears throat> I think just the newness of it is, is a challenge that we face in Las Vegas. And I'll, I'll second that. I mean, it's definitely a, it's a huge challenge and we have a lot of folks who grew up in these houses who say, I don't want that anymore. That's to me, that's considered old or outdated. And then, then these people become house flippers and rip all these wonderful features out of these houses. But so that's, that's probably the biggest challenge is just kind of overcoming that sense of, you know, this is, it's, it's not historic, it's dated. hardest thing we have in Las Vegas is, can, is that public interest and to get people interested in that. Um, it was described to me that Las Vegas, Las Vegas isn't founded on the past. You can't bet on the past, so there's no interest in the past. But this town is based on not what happened yesterday, but what's going to happen tomorrow. So the past really doesn't have a lot of meaning for people that live in Las Vegas. And until we can kind of change that attitude, I think it's going to be very difficult to kind of save what few landmarks we have left here. All right, well, thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you for a great conversation. Um, before we close, I just wanted to um, let people know that the Nevada Preservation Foundation has an ongoing speaker series this month, which is Historic Preservation Month. Uh, so Thursday, May 22nd, at the uh, UNLV Downtown Design Center, we'll be showing the Julius Schulman film called Visual Acoustics, and there'll be a discussion led by Heather Proats of CSN. And then next week, on May, Wednesday, May 28th, our board president, Jeff Wagner of Insight Studios, will be talking about brutalist architecture, which is one of the more fascinating types of mid-century architecture, I think. And I also wanted to remind you again to please fill out uh, the comment cards as you exit. Uh, if you enjoyed this evening's conversation, please consider becoming a member of the NEON Museum or of the Nevada Preservation Foundation as your membership makes educational programming possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.